Currently, only four teams make the playoffs, and next year there will be 12 in it, but what if 126 colleges did instead? Using CBS rankings, I've seeded every team in NCAA football, and we're going to see who wins the biggest playoff ever. It's double the size of March Madness, so you know that things are bound to get crazy with eight regions of 16 teams each spread across the entire country. Since Georgia's number one as I'm filming this, they get a first round bye, so our first matchup is between eight-seeded BYU and nine-seeded Syracuse, and with 48 seconds left, the Orange have a six-point lead, but BYU still has a chance. They need to go the length of the field to score a touchdown, but it is an opportunity, and to keep the drive alive, they need to get this fourth and one, which they do, but there's already under half a minute left, and they aren't even past midfield until this play. Keaton Slovis has set them up in a decent position where they could go for the Hail Mary, but I'd assume that the Cougars want to get a bit closer to the end zone, and he is going deep, which is going to be knocked away. That was almost a touchdown, but now they have one final shot. He gets the throw off, and it's a bit short, so the Orange are going to go into BYU Stadium and win, but their round of 64 matchup is going to be much harder, and I feel like Pittsburgh's a very dangerous 12 seed. Just like the last game, we have a team that is down by six with about a minute remaining, and the Panthers' defense has certainly kept them in it. They need to move down the field one more time, though, and Clemson's defense is kind of getting shredded right now. They have to step it up. That is going to be helpful, as that's going to be a tackle and bounce, and then Pitt committed a false start, so they've been moved back to second and 11, where they tried to check it down again. They have to start going for some deep shots, but instead they go with the halfback draw, and it's no wonder that Pitt only has seven points at this point in the game. Here's their final play attempt. It is going to be dropped and watching the Panthers offense must be brutal for Pitt fans. Clemson survives at home and up until the final four, the higher seed will have the home field advantage. So that should help the Blue Devils versus 13 seed USF. This is our first game that wasn't much of a contest with Duke winning by 35 and we'll see if six seeded Texas Tech can do the same versus 11 seeded Marshall. The Red Raiders weren't able to win by as much, but it's still a sizable victory and I'm ready to see some big upsets in this thing. 14 seed Southern Miss has Frank Gore Jr. on their team, but I have a hard time believing he'll single-handedly beat the Irish, so we're gonna have to wait a little longer to get the upset we're hoping for. Wyoming's actually the favorite in this next one, but on paper, their eight overalls worse, so this is a great chance for a 10 seed to get the win. The Cowboys have tried to keep up, but their play calling hasn't been very good, so a run on fourth and seven is gonna seal it. And it's crazy James Madison's a two seed, but they're undefeated in real life, so I figured that they'd do better than this, but with a minute and a half left, they are trailing, and that's gonna be intercepted from Ball State. Jordan McLeod didn't make the right read and now it's all on the Duke's defense because they could still force a three and out and have another opportunity but they have to make some tackles and on third and five 15 seed Ball State could pull it off but they're not going to. Now the Dukes are getting the ball at the two yard line so they're not having the greatest starting position but there's still plenty of time left on the clock for them to get at least a field goal and that ball was terrible. It almost looked like his offensive lineman got in the way of that throw so Jordan McLeod cannot be happy about that. He's had a rough day going 10 for 31 and with zero touchdowns to two interceptions that's not a very good ratio with him almost throwing another. If they don't get this fourth and three, we are witnessing our first major upset of the video, and that is what is going to happen, or maybe not. The throw gets off. It is caught at midfield. And how on earth is James Madison still alive? They could go down and score a touchdown. They're breaking tackles. I would assume they're at least nearing field goal range, but now they're getting even more. But their offensive linemen got too excited, so all of their momentum is going to come to a halt, and now they're just taking a check down, which gets them to about the four. The two seeds doing everything in their power to survive and they're going to which is just a brutal ending for 15 seed Ball State who thought they were going to pull off the upset. Wake Forest might have a favorable matchup in the next round but we have seven more regions with first round matchups to get through first and Alabama's the first one seed that has to play. They're taking on Tulsa at home so they should thrash them and that's exactly what happened winning 49 to 7. I know that one kind of stunk but this should be much better and both teams had about the same amount of yardage in this game but one scored more than others and Illinois last of ability to finish drives is what's going to cost them. So far in both regions, the nine seed has won, and I feel like 12 seed at Arizona State could pull off the upset here, so I'm not shocked that with 30 seconds left, they're up by eight, and UNLV is going to need a prayer. They're not representing the Mountain West Conference very well, but Brumfield is trying to escape, and he should have just thrown that ball away because they have no timeouts left, which meant that it took them way too long to spike the ball, and all they can do is throw it up, but his pocket awareness has been terrible, and that's it. A 12 seed is the highest seed that's won a game so far, but if Oklahoma State plays the way that they did against UCF, Northern Illinois could top that. I watched that game live in person, but it was brutal, so storming the field made up for it, and Oklahoma State played the exact same way in this one versus the Huskies, so I don't know if Ollie Gordon's month of October was a fluke or what, but there's pretty much no chance that they can win this one, and they've been struggling. It took the game letting this ball go through the Northern Illinois cornerback to let them have success, and the fact that we've witnessed back-to-back -back upsets is awesome. Iowa State's one of those teams that I can't believe is a six seed, but clearly they 
didn't deserve to be ranked that high as they're down by 10 with 8 seconds remaining and this game is over. There's nothing they can do to come back at this point and I can't believe how crazy the South region's been so far. Obviously, as a Kentucky fan, I'm rooting hard for South Dakota State in this next one and the 14 seed has a 7 point lead with a minute left which is just incredible. Joe Milton's not had a good day in the air completing less than 50% of his passes but he continues to take that same check down and the Aztecs need to make sure that they guard it in the future but they also have to stop them deep because you can't let that happen. It seems like the Tennessee offense is finally starting to figure it out as they're about to go for another first down and San Diego State's defense needs to clutch up here inside the 15 but they're not going to. However, the extra point is no good and of course I simmed it because it should have been a gimme so there's no replay available. That is how Tennessee is going to go out and to be honest I actually feel bad for volunteer fans. Our next game features two solid mid-majors with Miami Ohio as the seven seed and if their defense can hold on for 48 more seconds they're gonna win but we've seen double digit seed after double digit scene pull it off and how did they get that throw out? Carter Bradley did all that he could there but now it's fourth and one and they are going to somehow pick that up so even though it seems like South Alabama is about to be eliminated they are not giving up and with that big reception they've gotten to the 35 yard line but now they're going for an inbounds check down and that's not good. They're gonna have enough time to spike the ball but all they can do now is send up one more prayer to the end zone and this is for the game which is knocked away. Seven seeded Miami Ohio survives at home and this is the final matchup of the South region with Louisville as a two seed. They took care of business doubling their score versus the Pirates but that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody and both the Cardinals and the Crimson Tide have a pretty easy path for the next couple of rounds. Next up we have the East region where Florida State's the one seed and they shouldn't have any issues versus Akron but it was a little bit closer than I thought it would be and Jordan Travis is just running out the rest of the clock. This eight and nine seed matchup should be pretty competitive though but the Northwestern offense decided they didn't want to show up today only scoring 10 points on Cal. These Big Ten West offenses make me sick and five seeded Air Force should be on upset alert in this game. They overachieved early on but they've been losing in real life recently and trailing by six to the Hoosiers they're on a fourth and inches where they easily picked it up with the triple option but they still have to go down the field and score a touchdown so we'll see if their quarterback's able to throw the ball but normally they're used to running it instead. Also there's been like a million false starts in this video and I don't understand why but it's making it much harder on the offenses to do what they need to do. Fourth and seven 16 seconds remaining on the clock and Air Force picks it up so they are trying to score the go-ahead touchdown and Indiana's defense might just give it up. They only need a little bit more and that is going to do it. I probably should have spectated the extra point after what happened in the Tennessee game but it seems like the Falcons are going to survive against Indiana and the five seed's going to win. Their next opponent will be a team from the state of Tennessee and I honestly thought Vanderbilt was going to have a better season this year but they're two and nine in real life so it's weird that they're up by 12 with a minute remaining. Even if Memphis does score they're still going to need to get the onside kick and another touchdown so the SEC has had a lot of success early on and this fourth and goal will secure the upset for the Commodores as they are able to force the stop. I love that the underdogs have started to win and as an 11 seed Baylor feels under seeded. They're normally pretty good at football and they embarrass the Tigers so once again a double digit seed comes out on top and we'll see if three seeded Tulane's able to take care of business. Well they could with their defense holding Mill Tennessee State to zero points all game and if they keep playing that well they're going to be a tough out. Despite being the lower seed I'm expecting the SEC school to come out on top and unless Virginia Tech can come up with 10 points in 30 seconds that is exactly what's going to happen. It would almost be smart of them to take their field goal now then go for the onside kick but on fourth and six they want to pick it up instead and they don't so like I predicted the Razorbacks are going to win. So their next opponent will most likely be Oklahoma but there's always a slim chance of an upset in this game. I remember when my Wildcats lost to St. Peter's in March Madness but the Sooners defense came to play and it's taken all game for them to almost give up a touchdown but then they'd get the interception anyway and that concludes our matchups in the East region for now but we'll be back eventually and it's time to head over to Washington's. Their opening game is against Nevada and it shouldn't shock anybody that the Huskies offense was able to thrive as they put up 42 points and Michael Penix threw for four touchdowns. They're going to be a very tough team to beat and now we're at the bounce house where I was this past weekend. UCF had no issues with Georgia State and I gotta say I am so thankful for all of you because I've had multiple of you that work for college teams reach out to me and getting free tickets to a college game is a surreal experience. I just have to thank each and every one of you for making this YouTube thing a reality because without all the support that you all have shown I would not be where I'm at in life. I was in a bad spot last fall when it all started but we have got to focus our attention back on the tournament because UCLA is about to lose and 12 seeded Bowling Green simply outscored freshman quarterback Dante Moore. He has struggled all day and this last throw is going to go to the house I think but it's not going to matter they need another touchdown so all of that turned out to be for nothing and I'm curious how former five star JT Daniels does versus the USC defense. I mean he must have been all right if they're only down by seven with 45 
seconds left and they have the ball with a chance to tie it and we will see what rice can do could they pull off the upset at usc getting tackled inches short of the marker hurts but they still have 30 seconds and one time out to go 40 yards so it's not out of the question jt daniels needs to hike the ball a little bit quicker though he's just running it down to about 22 seconds and i don't know what all of that was maybe the pressure is getting to him it seems like they're not going to pick up the first down but their running back has fought for the yardage and as time winds down it seems like this is going to be the final play they have snapped it and jt daniels is going to go for the end zone but it's picked off so caleb williams is going to survive for now and he gets to face bowling green in the next round stanford's heading to the swamp next as an 11 seed but they're not playing like it as they're only down by three to the gators with about a minute and a half remaining ashton daniels has kept them in it and they're going to pick up the first down so their drive stays alive and all they need is a field goal to send it to overtime if the pressure's on anybody i'd say it's on florida since if they give up a touchdown they're gonna lose so we'll see if they switch anything up defensively to try to throw stanford off but that failed ram mertz has been left with 29 seconds left to get his team a touchdown which is very hard to do but they're getting a massive play here with the halfback screen and they also still have two timeouts so they're just gonna have to throw it up and hope for the best which worked out those first two plays of this drive couldn't have gone better for them but now they're doing that and that was a waste of precious time while also burning a timeout we'll see if they do anything better on second and ten but now the clock is starting to get to graham mertz and he just tried to force that ball into a window that wasn't there they're going deep and this one's knocked down but because it was such a quick play they're gonna have one more chance at it and this time it's also knocked away stanford's defense did it in the end and all of these upsets are a beautiful thing this is probably the most lopsided matchup we've seen yet though so at least on paper it looks like navy stands no chance in this one and that's exactly how it turned out wisconsin's going into this one as a seven seed but in my opinion they got a pretty easy first round matchup versus georgia southern and with a 29 point win they took care of business the last game in the northwest region features penn state and they just fired their offensive coordinator so we'll see what that does for them i'm thinking they might be missing him since they've only scored 12 points and buffalo could go down the field and score a field goal to win since james madison got a win this is probably the best chance at seeing a two seed lose in the first round but the bulls cannot afford to drop passes like that and they have a long way to go i mean they picked up the first down but they still need another 61 yards and i think that drop was a business decision their tight end knew it would only get them a few yards and the clock would keep running so i respect it and i'm impressed that buffalo has saved all three of their timeouts because i'm sure they're going to use them as they continue to get down the field penn state's defense is known for being one of the best so this is surprising to me but that was almost picked and cole snyder definitely got away with one there but why are they going with a run i mean it worked but they're refusing to use any of their three timeouts and this is going to be the final play of the game i don't know why they took all the time down but that was disappointing wait they broke the tackle and he doesn't make it but penn state is gonna escape with a win and all buffalo needed was literally a field goal you gotta love spectating the 2013 ai and now we're headed to the great lakes region where michigan gets a first round bye so the first game is between eight seeded texas state and nine seeded boise state i thought it might be a bit closer but that wasn't the case as texas state won by 35 and tj finley played pretty well they're gonna have a much harder matchup in their next game but now it's on fresno state to redeem the mountain west and they've done that against old dominion winning by 17 points with their next opponent being one of these two teams and toledo is the four seed i think their only loss in real life came on a last second field goal to illinois so they're definitely legit but they're trailing right now and they're very close to tying it up so we'll see what daquan finn does as he runs it in this is another case of the extra point not being good though and from this point forward i have to make sure i spectate these plays that is such a brutal way to lose but they have a chance at an onside kick and virginia fumbled the ball i think toledo just recovered it i don't know how it worked out for them but it slipped out of 17's hands and then they got it so daquan finn has been gifted another chance to get his team the win and we'll see what he can do i'm not sure they want to trust going for the field goal since their kicker missed the extra point but that might be their best option and with 35 seconds left he is throwing it about 20 yards which resulted in a catch they still have plenty of time to get even closer and on this one it is going to get intercepted by the cavaliers cornerback so 13 seeded virginia is going to get the win and i can't believe they pulled it off it seemed like toledo was about to finish the comeback and it wouldn't shock me if michigan state pulled off the upset in this game both teams were an 84 overall on paper and that's exactly what happened so maryland's been put out by the spartans and i don't know what that player was so happy about i'm very interested to see how arizona does in this tournament because for whatever reason they always make a deep run whenever i film this type of video and did they really just get an interception out of that i'm telling you the luck is gonna be on the wildcat side all day and noah fafita loves to put on a show coastal carolina is actually the higher seed in this one as a seven seed but on their teal field they came out and played some of the worst football they ever have and mississippi state's gonna beat them by 35 if lsu wins that's who they're gonna have to play next but we saw with penn state that the two seed dominating isn't always a given so i'm surprised that they've played this bad against louisiana tech they're only up by two with two minutes left and they
they're trying to run out the rest of the clock, but they passed on that down for whatever reason, and they're doing it again, which this time worked out for them. Jaden Daniels is simply just looking to put this one away, but there's still about 40 seconds left if they get two more stops on the run, so LSU needs to convert on this third and six, and they're not going to. We will see if Louisiana Tech can get in field goal range, but they're going to need some big plays with only 30 seconds left, and that's not happening. The one thing they couldn't do there was take a sack, and now they need to spike the ball. What is he doing? He took it all the way down to two seconds before clocking it, and there's been no urgency from them to try and score. I guess LSU is going to survive. The final Hail Mary attempt is up, and it's dropped, so the two seed survives again, and that wraps up the Great Lakes region, at least for now, because we got three more to get through before the round of 64. New Mexico never seems to be good in this game, and somebody needs to get out there and save their program, because this is just embarrassing. I think Nebraska might actually win their first round game too, which is crazy, but even with the home field advantage and being the better team on paper, they are losing by three points right now, and if they don't pick up this third and four, they're probably going to have to kick a field goal to tie it, but they're going to get it. Appalachian State is known for pulling off upsets over Power 5 programs, so we'll see if they can add another one to their track record, and they are not getting another third down stop. Nebraska is doing everything that they're supposed to, but if the Mountaineers aren't going to call timeouts, they should probably run down some of the clock, and I don't understand why they take a timeout. Now on third and goal, they are going to drop the ball, so they have no choice but to settle for a field goal, and they've left Appalachian State way too much time on the clock, but after taking that sack, they decided it would be better to just go to overtime. Nebraska would get held to a field goal on their first drive, and once again, Appalachian State has a chance to take the lead with a touchdown, but they got all the way down to the three-yard line and then failed the last time, so we'll see. It is third and six now after taking that sack, and I see a running back open, but they're going for a deeper shot, and it is intercepted. Number six simply wanted this football more than number two did, and Nebraska actually won a playoff game. I cannot believe what we just witnessed, but now it's time to check on a Texas A&M team without Jimbo Fisher, and their defense certainly wasn't perfect, but their offense ran up the score on Colorado State. This region hasn't had an upset yet, but with a backup quarterback, Kansas could be susceptible to one, and the fact that Army's offense hasn't scored any points themselves in this game is remarkable. The Jayhawks' defense has shut them down all day, and that was almost picked, but by now you can tell that the game is over, and Kansas fans can thank their defense and Devin Neal for the win. I'll be interested to see how they do against Texas A&M, and Troy might be a higher seed, but on paper in NCAA football, they're the worser of these two teams. They definitely shouldn't have lost by 27, but the Spartans just wanted it more, and that gives us the first upset here in the Plains region, with Iowa losing also being on the table if they can't score. I shouldn't even have to say anything at this point. You all knew exactly what to expect. There's another interception for UAB, and they are about to go up by even more. Deacon Hill only throwing for 103 yards is very fitting, and we'll see if seven-seeded Georgia Tech can hold off Houston. With a little over a minute remaining, they're trailing by four, so they need a touchdown, and the Yellow Jackets now find themselves in a third and nine situation where they are going to be marked a bit short, assuming he can't pick this up. Trey Cooley tried his best, but now they need four more yards, and Haynes King is going to miss his pass, so 10-seeded Houston is going to get a four-point win over Georgia Tech on the road, and I'm sure that they're rooting for Temple in this one. The recent games we've seen feature two seeds have been very close, but Oregon State played much better taking care of business, and they'll be moving on to the round of 64, where we'll see if they can continue to play well, and there's only two more regions that we have to get through before then. Ohio State's 35 overall is better than Kent State, so this could be the most brutal beatdown we've seen yet, and the Buckeyes did not disappoint, as it is 49-0, so obviously they're moving on to the round of 64, and their opponent will be one of these two teams. With a minute remaining, Ohio is trying their best to tie it back up at 31, but they're stuck on a fourth down, so they have to pick this up, and with the read option, they're not going to get it. Curtis Rourke took a terrible angle on that run, and if he would have done better, his team would be on to the next round. My Wildcats are up next against Utah State, and to be honest with you, I'd rather not talk about it or anything that has to pertain to Kentucky's football season this year because I've been left disappointed and we are going to pick up a big first down, but to come back at this point feels almost impossible because we're down by 16, and that means we have to get this two-point conversion where Devin Leary just got railed. Nobody even considered blocking this guy off of the edge, and I'm not even surprised by this result. We've We've helped pave an easy path for NC State to get to the round of 32, but with a minute remaining, they are in a close game with FAU, and if their defense can come up clutch, they could end it, but that might not happen. The Owls have two more chances to reach the end zone, and on this third and goal play, Richardson's going to get outside the pocket. He has the speed to get there, but he doesn't. So it all comes down to this fourth and goal on the half-inch line, where they tried to pass it instead of run it in. Four seeded NC State's going to survive, and they'll probably win in the next round as well. Cincinnati's fallen off hard as they're now an 11 seed, but it looks like they're going to force overtime against the Hurricanes as it's all tied up. There's a chance they could pull off the upset, and on Miami's first drive on third and three, they're going to pick up the first down. But they keep getting to these third down situations, and this one doesn't work out. That means they're being forced to settle for a field.
field goal. And with a touchdown, Cincinnati could win this game. But so far, their offense hasn't looked the best. And on third down, Emory Jones just took a little flat, which means we are going to go to another overtime, assuming this went in. Cincinnati got down to a third and goal in that one where they are going to score. But Miami responded back and opted to kick the extra point. These teams seem to be going back and forth on this third and inches. Tyler Van Dyke is going to throw it to the end zone. But now they have to start trading two point conversions back and forth. And on this play, they're not going to pick it up. That means if Cincinnati scores a touchdown and the two point conversion, they're going to win. But that was almost picked. And I don't know what Emory Jones is doing back there, but it isn't working out too well for them. It is fourth and one and Cincinnati has opted to go with the pass and that is going to be dropped. So the Miami defense locked up in the end. And to be honest, Henderson should have held onto the football. We're not going to get an upset in that one though. And most likely the three seeded Tar Heels will be the Hurricanes next opponent. Drake May went out there and lit it up, throwing for three touchdowns in the win. And I'd have to pick seven seeded Boston College to come out on top of this one. They're the favorites and five overalls better on paper, but Hudson Card's been trying his best to keep his team in it. And if the Boilermakers can score a touchdown quick enough without burning any of their three timeouts, it's not over. They're getting very close to doing so, and he is going to pitch it on the option to Mockaby. So I'd expect them to kick it deep, but they went with the onside kick instead, and that puts Boston College in good field position. If the Eagles have a good kicker, even if they don't pick up a first down, it could be over. But Purdue is willing to take that risk, and their defense is doing a pretty good job right now. They just need to pick up a stop on third and eight. Castellanos finds his guy over the middle, though, and that is a first down. So Boston College is moving on to the next round, and they'll be facing either Ole Miss or 15 seeded Charlotte. Well, that was pretty brutal as the Rebels are going to win 38 to 0 at home. And the only upset in this region was Utah State over my Wildcats. So hopefully in the final region of the round of 126, we get some more. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting it to happen that soon, but we could have a big upset because 16 seed Louisiana Monroe is about to go up on the Oregon Ducks. They've had 21 first down to Oregon six, and now they're on this two yard line where they're snapping the ball, handing it off and not getting in. But they've somehow gone into their home stadium and completely outplayed them. So it's on Bo Nix to help his team tie it up. And on this third and inches, they're going to go backwards by five yards. I can't believe what we're witnessing right now, but here on fourth and seven, they're going to pick it up with Troy Franklin and they're trying so hard to come back now. But what is going on? Oregon's offense actually looks lost out there. And on third and 10, Bo Nix is going to have six people protecting him. So he had a bunch of time, but he still only took a check down. So they gain no yards. And on this fourth and 10, he's going deep and this is going to be a bad throw. I doubt Louisiana Monroe's in field goal range, but if they are, it's already over and they're getting closer. So a 16 seed beating a one seed is an actual possibility and that does it. That is a very embarrassing loss for the Ducks and I'm sure that Minnesota and Colorado are thrilled about it. The winner of this game gets Louisiana Monroe now and with a minute and a half remaining Colorado has a four point lead but it's on their defense to hold on to it. They're going to need to get a stop before the Gophers are able to reach the end zone but they're about to give up what looks like another 15 plus yard play and Deion Sanders needs to get his defense fired up. On first and 10 that's going to be just a few yards so that'll really hurt Minnesota and then they had a false start. It happened so quick but now there's only about 30 seconds remaining on the clock. And that sack now makes it third and 22 for the Gophers where they just went with the dump off. It was looking good for them for a brief second, but now they don't have much of a chance besides throwing up a 50-50 ball. And it was swatted away, which means Colorado is going to win and face off against a 16 seed in the next round. Even though Rutgers is the five seed, I don't trust them to come out on top. And I'm starting to get really good at making these predictions because I saw this coming from a mile away where it's a blowout. Rutgers just didn't play very well. So the lower seeds continue to win. And I'm sure that SMU will do their best to break that streak. It seems like that's what's going to happen as it is fourth and 20 for Central Michigan. They're down by 10 and they're definitely not going to pick this up. So the streak of upsets has been broken, but Western Kentucky's looking to resume it and I think they're going to. They're going up three possessions with a minute and a half left. So West Virginia is down by a ton and in the end, the score remained the same. This region has pretty much been everything that I've dreamed about. And since Kentucky's already out, I want to see as much chaos as possible. We could be getting that in this one with 14 seed North Texas because with 40 seconds remaining, they're only trailing by seven and they're close to scoring on Kansas State with this run going to the 10. They need something on third and four though to convert downs and they went for the touchdown and I've remembered to start watching extra points. So it seems like we're going to overtime unless Kansas State pulls off the miracle and they weren't able to do so. The mean green could really use a defensive stop on their first drive, but they're not going to get it. So now to keep their upset hopes alive, they have to score. It is third and 13 and this one's going to go seven. So it all comes down to this play where Kansas State sent a bit of a blitz and they have coverage over there where they're going to get the interception. It was a great effort from the Mean Green, but it's hard to take down a three seed. And there's only two more matchups left in the first round. To be a 10 seed in this now, Washington State must have fallen off really hard. And apparently they're on a six game losing streak, but as I'm recording this, they're pounding Colorado. So maybe they'll start to bounce back. They have the ball with 40 seconds left in a tie game and Cam Ward just fumbled it away. So UTSA can 
win with a field goal and Frank Harris is getting that ball out as quick as he can. I cannot believe that Washington State just turned it over in that situation, but it's probably going to put them out. And UTSA is doing their best to take advantage of it with this one going for another first down. All they're going to do is settle for a field goal by running the ball. So there's not much that the Cougars can do and they didn't even ice them. UTSA was the favorites as the seven seed and they're moving on to the next round where I'd be very surprised if they weren't facing Missouri. I mean, Eastern Michigan did better than I thought, but it was always going to be an uphill battle. So that concludes the round of 126 and it's time for the matchups to get even more competitive. Since Georgia had a first round bye, this is the first game they have to play and they did very well winning 34 to three against the Orange. It was a blowout, but this next one shouldn't be. So I'm surprised that Duke is down by double digits because in real life, they were able to pull this one off. Riley Leonard threw it 44 times, but that wasn't enough. And we get Clemson versus Georgia in the round of 32. Our next matchup features six-seeded Texas Tech versus three-seeded Notre Dame. And I can't believe that the Irish are going to go out like this, but they're trailing by 12 with only 10 seconds left and Sam Hartman looks lost. He couldn't do anything there on fourth and 10. So the Red Raiders are moving on to play the winner of the next one. And two-seeded James Madison is the underdog on paper. That didn't stop their defense from playing amazing though. So with a minute remaining, they have a seven-point lead and I cannot believe how low scoring this game has been. Now they're giving up a big play. And could this be the drive where Wake Forest finally figures it out? Mitch Griffiths has not been good, but at some point you'd think that they would do better and on this next play he just took his check down. That caused the clock to run under 30 seconds and on third and eight he couldn't get the throw out. So it all comes down to this fourth and 15 where Wake Forest needs to stay alive. The ball is in the air and it is swatted away. James Madison has survived and the two seed is on to the round of 32. But before we start that round, we have a lot more games to get through. We'll see if nine seeded South Carolina can give Alabama any issues, but it should be no surprise that Spencer Rattler struggled, so at the end of the game, they don't even have him out there. The Crimson Tide are going to get the win, and they'll be facing one of these two double-digit seeds. In the end, Arizona State was able to double the score of the Huskies, so they'll be the underdog team moving on, and I had forgotten how many upsets this region had. Louisiana was the higher seed of these two, but they haven't played well against San Diego State, so they're shooting for a last-second comeback, but it isn't going to happen. That onside kick recovery is going to seal it, and they'll be versing the winner of this matchup. But before we see that result, a word from today's video sponsor, Price Picks. I personally think the CJ Baxter one is a steal because he hasn't cleared that fantasy score recently, and I'm going to combine it with this free Christian McCaffrey square, which is available until kickoff on Thanksgiving. Doing that gives me an opportunity to triple my entry fee, and if you want to support the channel, join me on Price Picks or just have something fun to do while watching football, code board, or this QR code doubles your initial deposit up to $100. They're now available in 31 different states, and make sure you play responsibly when you sign up using code board. With two minutes left, it is all tied up at 17. Miami, Ohio has the ball, but they're taking a sack. So they had to punt it back to the Cardinals, and Jack Plummer has a chance to get his team the win, but that was almost picked. Miami, Ohio is kind of underrated as a seven seed, so it's no surprise that they're in this game, but it would still be a massive deal if they could pull off the upset against Louisville, so we'll see what happens. There's still plenty of time for the Cardinals to score, and on second and five, Kevin Coleman somehow came down with it, but it's still third and inches, and this one isn't going anywhere. Defense has definitely been a big deal in this game for both of these teams, and unless the Red Hawks start going with some deep shots, we're probably just going to see overtime. Brett Gabbert's trying to get back into a rhythm with some of these shorter throws, but it's not going to go for a ton, and he is putting on a clinic, as on this next one, they're just going to go out of bounds again. I guess it's been working for them so far, but then they went with a run, and they're so lucky that was marked as a first down, so the clock didn't run too much. On this next one, they're going to throw an interception, but Louisville dropped it, and that could have been a pick six. That was their opportunity opportunity to run away with it, but instead they're just going to have to get a sack. And unless something miraculous happens on this third and 18, we're going to overtime. Like we've seen time and time again, this entire game has been all about defense. And on third and three, Miami, Ohio could force Louisville off the field, but they can't make the tackle in time. It seems like that'll lead to a Louisville touchdown with Jawar Jordan if he gets in, but he should have taken a better angle there and they have faked them out with the read option instead. Now it's on Brett Gabbert. We're on third and four. He has enough time back there. He moves around in the pocket and he throws it into an interception. So the seven seed is going to come up short at Louisville. And that concludes the games for now in the South region. Next up, we have the East one and Cal has the tough task of playing at Florida State, but they've done a good job to stay in this game and they're only trailing by three. On paper, they're an 88 overall team, so they could give teams a lot of issues as a nine seed, but that was a rough sack for Sam Jackson the fifth to take because now it's third and 18 where he's going to do it again. If there's any Golden Bear fans watching this video, I'm sorry to break the news to you, but I don't think you're going to win. You have a chance on this fourth and 23 and it is caught. What a catch. He is still breaking tackles and fighting all the way to the 22. Trond Grizzle just made the play of the game. I'm assuming he's their tight end, but then it is thrown into a pick. And how did Florida State just get away with this one? I could have sworn that they were going to get upset after that big play, but instead they get to face the winner of this one. And look at 13-seeded Vanderbilt knocking off Air Force. They've played
played a really good game, having more than double of the first downs the Falcons have, which means that they've made the round of 32. And 11 seeded Baylor already pulled off the upset against Auburn, so I thought they might do the same versus Tulane, but that hasn't been the case. They're down three possessions with just a minute left, so they don't have much of a chance. And if they can't score on this fourth and four, it'll definitely be over with Tulane sealing the game. Now, I'm sure that they're preying on Oklahoma's downfall, and Arkansas has a roster on NCAA football that can compete with the Sooners, which is why I'm not shocked that they're up by 11 with two minutes left. Oklahoma's gone down the field though, and they're looking to reach the end zone. So now that they have, they're only within five, and on a two-point conversion, they bring it within three. It'll really come down to if their defense can force a three and out on Arkansas or not, and Sanders is killing them. So we'll see if they can stop him, but he just keeps going for big gains. If Raheem Sanders gets one more first down, it's over, and he does, sealing Arkansas the win. So the 10-seeded Razorbacks have pulled it off, and the East region has two double-digit seeds making some noise. Over in the Northwest one, there were only a couple of upsets, but we could see more in this round, and it's sure not going to come from UCF as they're trailing by 28 points, and that's another pick. The Knights did not do well there, and Bowling Green might not either, so the matchups in the Northwest region haven't been very interesting so far as USC destroyed the 12 seed, and I'm hoping that Stanford can put up more of a fight, but being on the road at Utah makes things pretty difficult. They already upset Florida, so we can't expect them to get another one, but they are not out of this game yet, and if Ashton Daniels can get his team in field goal range, we should be headed to overtime. This throw is going to be knocked away, and honestly, it should have been picked, but it wasn't, so the drive stays alive for the time being, and that is somehow intercepted on this one. It took me watching it in instant replay to realize how much effort he put in there, and when your defense has awareness like that, you're moving on to the round of 32, where all three colleges that have moved on from this region have been from the Pac-12, and now the Big Ten's looking for some representation, with Penn State most likely being the one that moves on. They're the higher seed, so this was expected, so despite Jareller's struggles, they've won, and all four of the top four seeds in the Northwest have made the round of 32, but it's not possible for the same thing to happen in the Great Lakes region. Unfortunately for four-seeded Toledo, they got upset, and obviously one-seeded Michigan, who had a bye in the first round, is going to get the win over Texas State, but what I'm curious about is how Virginia does versus Fresno State. They're in it with a minute remaining, but they're going to have to score a touchdown to tie it back up, and the 13 seed has an 87 overall defense while only having a 72 overall offense. That means it would be a lot to expect them to finish this drive off, but Mike Collins is going to throw a guy off of him, and he continues to fight for more. He wants his team to pull off another upset, but they still need to get about 10 more yards, and after spiking it on second down, it's third and four where they just go with the halfback draw, and it only resulted in a one-yard gain, so they're going to need a bit more on fourth down, but they can't get it. Five-seeded Fresno State gets another win, but unfortunately for them, their next opponent is Michigan. As for Michigan State, I'm sure they want to shock the world versus Arizona, but it took them until there were eight seconds left to get the ball back, and they're going deep already, which gets them to about midfield. With no timeouts remaining, they need to make sure that they spike it quick, the clock is at one second, and they're going to have a shot at a Hail Mary. It took them so long to stop Arizona's rushing attack, but they have given themselves a chance, and this ball does not reach the end zone, so the three seed's going to survive at home, and they'll be facing either Mississippi State or LSU. If I had to set a line for this game, I'd put it at like LSU minus 20 and a half, but evidently I should have flipped those numbers around because the Bulldogs are going crazy. They have a 19-point lead on the Tigers with less than a minute remaining, and there's not much that the Tigers can do because they would need like a million different things to go their way, and it all starts with this onside kick, which they never had a chance of recovering. Both them and Oklahoma have left their fan bases down as two seeds, and we're about to see if Nebraska can ever be back. They're going into a tough environment at DKR Stadium, but what am I looking at right now? Quinn Ewers is healthy on this roster, so how on earth are the Longhorns losing to the Cornhuskers? They're going to practically need a miracle if they want to pull off the comeback, and they have to go down the field much quicker than this. So we'll see what happens, but I think eight-seeded Nebraska might actually pull this off. They have 410 total yards of offense compared to Texas's 274, so it makes sense why they're winning, but on paper, they're 16 overalls worse, and they had to play this on the road. I enjoy seeing chaos, though, so this is perfect. And why would Texas burn a timeout in that situation? Now they have to rely on recovering the onside kick, and they don't get it. So as long as Nebraska just hands it off, it's all over. And you know what? I'm gonna say it. Nebraska might be back. It might never happen in real life, but it's happened in NCAA football. And their next opponent is either the five-seeded Aggies or the four-seeded Jayhawks. Well, apparently Jason Bean couldn't get the job done even though they were at home. And the following game is between two double-digit seeds. To get to this point, both of them had to pull off upsets. And the higher seed's gonna to come out on top of this one, winning by 14. UAB's defense did a great job, and this has to be the highest combination of seeds we've seen in a region so far. If Houston wins, it would make the total even higher, but this Oregon State offense is legit as they've coasted to another win, so they're the highest seed remaining in the Plains region, and now we're headed over to the Northeast. We're about to see if TCU can keep up with one seed Ohio State, but if they can't pick up this fourth and five, it's all over, and they were not able to do so. They'll be playing either 12-seeded Utah State or 4-seeded NC State next, and I cannot believe that my Wildcats 
loss to this team. They just got annihilated by the Wolfpack, so they've been eliminated from the playoffs, and I'm excited to see who comes out on top of this one. It seems like North Carolina will, but it's not over unless they get another first down, and Drake May was very close to reaching it, but Omari and Hampton's not going to get it on this one, so it's third and three where they're actually going with the pass, and that's a touchdown. It was a risky move, but it pays off for the Tar Heels because they were able to knock out the Hurricanes, and this might be an uphill battle for Boston College. I figured it wouldn't be pretty, but I thought they'd keep it closer than this, and for the second time in this round, all top four teams in this region have made it to the round of 32, but since Oregon lost, that can't happen over here in the Southwest. Deion Sanders and his team have been gifted such an easy path, but with a minute and a half left, they're only up by six points. They have to pick up a first down to seal it, and Dylan Edwards didn't go anywhere there, so it is third and ten where Shadur Sanders has five receivers on the field, and on the corner route, they're going to pick it up. I'm impressed at how close Louisiana Monroe just kept it, but in the end, they couldn't pull it off, so they've unfortunately been eliminated, and we'll see if Arkansas State has what it takes to get another upset. Well, I wasn't expecting this, but they're about to go up 29-0, to zero, and the SMU offense is broken because there's two minutes left in the fourth quarter, and they still haven't scored. I cannot believe how bad the Red Wolves are going to beat them, but I'm sure Colorado fans love to see this result, and I love how much chaos there's been in this video. Western Kentucky might get it done versus Kansas State as well, as they have a lead with about a minute left. This ball is going to be dropped, but I think that was the right move from Will Howard to try to switch the fields with one play, and now he's going for 20. However, apparently they're saying that he didn't get a foot in bounds, and it's not being reviewed, so Kansas State is now on third and 10, where the Will Howard's going to take a sack. The three seed is about to be knocked out by an 11 seed if they don't pick up this fourth and 22, but they just gashed right by that cornerback, and how is Kansas State going to tie this thing up? Phillip Brooks just ran right by him, and yes, I'm making sure I watch the extra point. In overtime, though, after taking a bad sack, it is third and 19 for the Wildcats' first drive, and this is going backwards, so they don't have a choice but to go for it on another fourth and long instead of kicking a field goal, and this is also going to be caught. Phillip Brooks cannot continue to get away with this, but he keeps pulling it off, and that would lead to a Kansas State touchdown, which puts the pressure on Western Kentucky. It's fourth and four, so they need to get something big here, and that is going over the middle to the 10, but they still have more yardage that they need to gain, and they are down to about the two. This might be the best game that we've gotten to watch yet, and the Hilltoppers have to keep it alive on this fourth and goal, where they're going with the pass instead of the run. I see somebody open, and it's knocked away instead. Austin Reed didn't make the right read there, and three-seeded Kansas State somehow survived, but it definitely wouldn't have been possible without Phillip Brooks, and now we have the final matchup of the round of 32. I can't believe it, but seven-seeded UTSA has a lead right now, and they could end it if they score on this third and goal, but if they're stopped, Missouri still has a chance. To be honest, if I were them, I would have just gone for it here, but they played it safe because their defense has done a solid job all day on Missouri, and to pull off the upset, they just need to stop them one more time, but it's not going to be easy to do. When he plays well, Luther Bird in the third's one of the best wide receivers in the country, and the Tigers are already past midfield with a minute left, so they have time on their side right now. But to keep the drive alive, they have to pick up this fourth and one, and that's what they're going to do. It's been dump off after dump off for Brady Cook, but it's worked out in their favor, and now they're going to need to start shooting for some bigger gains because there's only 24 seconds left. Time went away so quick, and this ball was put right where it needed to be, but it was not held on to. I'm sure the Tigers will pick this up with a little check down underneath, but he went backwards, and that's going to be short. The two seed's been knocked out by the Roadrunners, and every remaining college is now competing for a spot in the Sweet 16. There's going to be some really great matchups in this round like this one, and with a minute and a half left, Clemson's in it, but they're down by three, so we will see what they can do. Keg Klubnik's keeping it on this option, and he gets eight, but if they don't pick up this third down, they're probably going to kick the field goal, and that's a catch. The ball is in the hands of Carson Beck, but the Tigers are on the verge of pulling off a pretty big upset because Georgia was the favorites going into this thing, and even though they're even on paper, Clemson's a five seed. The NCAA football roster still have them at like a 93 overall though, which is insane, and that is going to get him past midfield. But after running the ball, the clock is down to just 20 seconds left. Carson Beck is going deep, and it is underthrown. That could have been it for Clemson, but they've given Georgia a shot still by not holding on to the football, and this time it's just a check down, which gets to the first round marker. What's crazy is if Dejon Edwards was marked short there, they wouldn't have had a chance to get another snap off, but now they do. And with that ball thrown out of bounds, there's one last shot to the end zone where Carson Beck puts it up, and it's knocked away. The Bulldogs tried, but the Tigers were just the better team, and they're the first program to make it into the Sweet 16. On the other side of the Southeast region, we have two-seeded James Madison versus six-seeded Texas Tech, and the Dukes didn't play very well as they're going down by 34 points. Tyler Shuck couldn't have played any better, getting his team into the next round versus Clemson, and we'll see if either of these double-digit seeds can win in the South region. Obviously, it's going to be hard for either of them to pull off the upset, but Arizona State might do it as with a minute remaining, they have a 13-point lead. Their defense has played so well against Jalen Milrow, and the one-seeds in this playoff are starting to fall. We'll see what happens next, because after scoring the touchdown, they're going for the onside kick, and the Sun Devils are going to recover the ball. They have all three of their timeouts.
time out so they can get it back, but it's not going to be easy and this run goes for about eight, which means we are on the verge of watching another one seed get eliminated. And with that being marked as a first down, it's all over. We're starting to get a lot of results that don't make much sense, but I'm hoping for another one with 14 seed San Diego State. And what is happening right now? With a minute and a half left, the Cardinals are trailing. So two seeded Louisville could be eliminated if they're not able to finish off this drive with a touchdown, but it looks like Plummer's going to take it in. We're also going to watch them drill the extra point. And now it's on San Diego State to go down the field and kick a field goal for the win over the Cardinals. Jalen made in the lefties already completed one pass for eight yards and now we got another seven. So the Aztecs offense is moving the ball, but I'm not sure what their kicker's range is and Jalen Maiden just broke a tackle which would have resulted in a sack. I'm not sure how we turn that play into a positive, but it seems to work out for them as they complete that. And they have all three of their timeouts, but they're not using them or hiking the ball. This play has taken 30 seconds to set up, so it better be a good one and it is going to just get a first. But they've fallen short of making it to field goal range unless this pass worked out for them. I don't know why the computer just pauses sometimes and doesn't hike the ball, but here's their last shot at the end zone and it's not even close. So Louisville undeservingly gets to escape with a win and the two seeds the highest seed to make the Sweet 16 yet. This is what the South region's going to look like in the end. And over in the East, we have to see what Vanderbilt can do. Florida State almost got upset in their last one versus Cal. And I don't know what's going on with their offense, but it's a good thing that their defense has been so good. Vanderbilt's not out of it yet, but they need to finish this drive off with a touchdown and they do. So they still have a tad bit of hope. And with the onside kick, they honestly should have just kicked it deep. With all three of their timeouts remaining, that wasn't worth the risk. And I don't think they have good run defense. So it seems like the road is going to end here for the Commodores, but they had a very good run. Florida State's the first one seed to actually make it here. And they're either getting three seeded Tulane or 10 seeded Arkansas next. Well, it took the Razorbacks a while, but we finally saw the Arkansas that we know and love. So KJ Jefferson's not going to get another win. And it's because his stat line looks like he plays for Iowa. These are the final two teams remaining in the East region. And in the Northwest, we should have a couple of good ones. USC should not be better on paper, but Washington having the home field advantage balances it out. And this game wasn't as high scoring as I thought it would be. On fourth and 10, USC needs to pick it up to stay alive and they don't make it. So Caleb Williams is going to be eliminated. And Michael Penix Jr. continues to dominate. On the other side of the region, this is the other matchup. And Utah's trying to take a lead with this drive where they're getting very close to doing so. All they need is another nine or 10 yards and they're going to get four here. But then they're going to give it to Jaquindon Jackson again. And this one went nowhere. That gets them to third and goal where they just faked me out with the handoff going down to the one yard line. And I'd assume that they're just going to hand this one off, but they're not snapping it. And it goes to Jaquindon Jackson who gets in. The two point conversion makes a massive difference for Utah and they're converting. So Penn State is in a bit of trouble and we will see what Drew Aller can do. What's crazy to me is because Bryson Barnes got hurt, the Nittany Lions have been facing off against Utah's backup quarterback and it's still not going well, but maybe there's still a chance that they get in field goal range and go to overtime, but not by taking sacks like that. There is 30 seconds left. It's second and 20. That ball is going to be thrown into an interception and Drew Aller has lost the game. I don't know how Utah just pulled this one off, but they were able to get the win with Nate Johnson and he even won player of the game. The Utes are on to the Sweet 16 and Michigan's trying to do the same versus Fresno State. We've already seen multiple one seeds lose in the round of 32, but I did not see Michigan being in a close game with Fresno State with a minute and a half left. The ball is in the hands of Mikey Keene, and if he can drive his team down the field, they could get an upset win, but that was dropped, and he has to be livid about that. This literally could have resulted in a touchdown, and if they lose this game, we can put the blame on that wide receiver as it's now going to be fourth down unless he can fight for even more. It seems like Michigan might survive, but we'll see what happens, and that's going to be intercepted by the Wolverines. They have the ball at midfield, but with three timeouts left, we can't count Fresno State out of it yet because they could still force a three and out if they could stop Blake Corm. But with that run, he got so close to the first down marker and he should be able to seal it right here, which he does, except now he's going backwards. They still gave him forward momentum on that play, so it is over. But Michigan cut that one pretty close and 10 seeded Mississippi State's been on a tear, so Arizona better be careful. Somehow they still didn't come prepared as they're down by three with around a minute and a half left in the game. But they have the ball, so they could score on this drive and take the lead or they could kick a field goal to tie it up. And it all kind of depends on whether or not they pick up this third and inches which they do with the run, and that gets them to the 12. If Noah Fafita can just thread the needle to the end zone one time, they could get the win. But his offensive line isn't doing him any favors. And with that false start, it is now second and 13, where he just goes over the middle into an interception. That is it. Mississippi State's going to win. But it says there's a flag on the play, and it was after the pick, so it's not going to help Arizona. The Bulldogs have been on a tear, beating both LSU and Arizona now in the tournament. So by now, nobody should be overlooking them. And maybe they'll beat Michigan to win the Great Lakes region. It's weird to see Nebraska doing well over in the Plains one. But if if they can't win at Kyle Field, their run's going to come to an end. And Max Johnson has been doing such a good job for the Aggies, getting them a 20-point win. I still don't know how the Cornhuskers beat Texas, but now I'm focused on 14 seed UAB at Oregon State. And the fact that they are up by eight points with two minutes remaining is crazy to me. The Beavers have looked really good in some of their other matchups, but today it's been a different story and it is all on DJ 
ukulele to finish it off. That sack now makes it third and 14, where UAB is going to send in another four, and he just could take the check down. So it seems like the two seeded Beavers are about to be eliminated if they don't pick this up, and that ball just gets them the first down. They're cutting it close, but with the ball on the 35 and 53 seconds left, there's plenty of time. So if they're able to keep this up, we might see it go into overtime, and that ball was placed perfectly. The Beavers need the two point conversion, though, and I see the hitch that's wide open, which gets taken. So it is 24 to 24, and UAB is going with the angle route, but I'll be curious if they actually try to get in field goal range or just take it to overtime. After taking that sack, they're doing exactly what I expected out of them, and that ball is just knocked away. So the game is far from over, and we'll see if they can finish off this first drive with a touchdown, but their quarterback didn't throw it. He had his halfback wide open, which is why that made no sense. But now it all comes down to if Oregon State scores a touchdown or not, and if they do, they're going to be safe from getting upset. It's honestly not looking great for UAB, but we'll see what ends up happening. And on this play, DJ Ugalele is just going to go over the middle for about 14, which puts the Beavers on the one yard line where they're just going to take it into the end zone. They were able to escape in the end, so they're the higher seed of the two remaining in the Plains region, and I'm excited to see what happens out in the Northeast. NC State's had a pretty simple path to get to this point, so I don't think it's any surprise that they struggled against Ohio State, losing by 24 points. And on the other side of the region, we have a very even matchup, but it seems like the Tar Heels are going to run away with it unless Ole Miss can come back. The Rebels are going to need a lot to go their way, and they're not recovering this onside kick, but they've got North Carolina out of field goal range for the time being, so I guess there's still an opportunity for them to win, but they're giving that up, and the Tar Heels are pretty much going to seal it from there. Besides his one interception, Drake May did a fantastic job, but his next opponent in the Sweet 16 is Ohio State, so we'll see what happens after we get through these final two round of 32 matchups. It's hard to imagine that 9-seed Colorado would lose to 12-seed Arkansas State, but maybe not. The Buffaloes haven't played anybody good yet, and they're down by four right now, so they need to be able to reach the end zone, and Shadur Sanders is hooking up with Jimmy Horn Jr. That was big for them because it was third and 12, but they still need to pick up at least eight more yards, and with this pass, that could be intercepted. It's tipped away, but nobody on Arkansas State was able to come down with it, even though it was that close. So Deion Sanders' team stays alive, and that was a weird third down call. Dylan Edwards is super tiny, so there's no way he was reaching the end zone there. It all comes down to this, though, and they convert. So Colorado has taken a lead, but Arkansas State could respond back. They have all three of their timeouts remaining, and they have about 40 seconds as well, so there is a chance. But by the looks of that first play, they're going to have to draw up something better. They've scored effortlessly all day, so I don't know why they're struggling now, but it's going to be fourth down. And Colorado is playing for their spot in the Sweet 16, where they have sent in enough pressure, but it didn't come in in time. So they are lucky that he was marked short of the marker, and that they're going to pick up another win. It's been a journey for them so far, but they keep pushing forward. And no matter who wins this, their next opponent is going to be their hardest one yet. Well, with about eight seconds left, Kansas State is down by 13. They're going for a deep shot to the end zone, and it is held on to. And of course, it was none other than Philip Brooks Jr. who came down with this football. I think it's too late for them to pull off the comeback, but they had a chance at the onside kick, and they're not able to recover it. So seven seed UTSA is moving on to the next round, and this is what the bracket looks like with 16 teams remaining. There's only a few real underdogs that have made it this far, but it was a shock that both Clemson and Texas Tech got out of their region, and the Tigers have destroyed the Red Raiders in this game. Clemson's playing so well right now, and I'm sure their fans wish they could have started their season in real life this way, but no matter who wins this game, they have a decent shot at making the Final Four, and with about two minutes remaining, it is all tied up at 21. Louisville should be trying to kill more clock than they are before taking it in, but I guess they wanted to give Arizona State a chance, and on first and 10, they're picking up a few yards. I'm almost certain that Jaden Rashada isn't the Sun Devils quarterback in real life anymore, but he's been starting for the 12 seed team in this entire tournament, and it's worked out so far. Nobody expected them to get to the Sweet 16, and they're competing with the two seeded Cardinals right now on their home turf, so we'll see if he can continue to cook, but now he's handing it off, and that's going for about eight. I've not seen any resistance from the Cardinals defense when it comes to stopping Arizona State, so they need to figure it out as soon as possible because it is about to be all tied at 28. It's feeling like an overtime type of game with Jaden Rashada throwing this one to the end zone, but he missed his target by a mile, and that might have been for the best because now they're getting to the three. Time is ticking down, but they should be able to get two more plays off. This one's going to be intercepted by Louisville. That is going to seal it. The Cardinals are going to survive, and I wonder if he's going to be able to take this to the crib. It really doesn't matter because they have earned their spot in the Elite Eight, and their next opponent is going to be Clemson. If Florida State can win this, the ACC is going to be looking really good in the playoffs, and they have a lead with about 45 seconds left, but Tulane is trying their best to tie it up, and breaking that tackle is going to get them the first down and maybe a touchdown. Shady Clayton made sure he got in there, but they have to pick up this two-point conversion to tie it up, and they're not going to. The Seminoles' defense has been locking down, and they're going to recover the onside kick, so it seems like Florida State's going to win, but Tulane could force a three and out with their three timeouts, so they need to stop Jordan Travis on the run, and they were able to, but only after he got seven yards. Now Trey Benson is going to break one tackle, and he keeps fighting to get even more positive gains, so that makes this a third and manageable where Jordan 
Jordan Travis keeps it and seals the game for his Seminoles. Tulane did pretty well, but they couldn't make it to the Elite Eight, and the winner of this one will get to play Florida State next. To be honest, I didn't expect Bryson Barnes to keep the Utes in this game, but they are with a minute left, so if they can find a way to reach the end zone here, they could tie it all up. He's going for it, and that's going to be intercepted by Washington instead. With this result, we're going to get to see two one seeds battle it out for the first time, and it'll be a high-powered offense versus what's been a high-powered defense for the Seminoles. Michigan's another one seed that could continue their run, and Mississippi just gave up with about a minute and a half left. They're down by 17, but instead of going for it on 4th and 20, they punted the ball back, so I guess they're going to let the Wolverines just win, and I don't understand it, but we'll continue to push through these matchups. Two-seed Oregon State has a six-point lead on five-seed Texas A&M right now, but the Aggies have the ball, so with this drive, they could avoid elimination if it's successful, and that was a bad sack for Max Johnson to take. It's gone from second and two to third and nine, and they're just going to go for about six, seven, eight, or nine here, so they got the first down that they desperately needed to stop the clock, but now they're just going to fall down in bounds anyway, so hopefully they can learn from that and start going with some deep shots, because with no timeouts left, they can't do stuff like this. They need the first, but Amari Daniels was marked just short, so the clock continues to run, and they're going to pick this up, but then they're going to commit a false start, so the only thing they can really do is take some deep shots to the end zone, but that works too. Oregon State's defense is so close to finishing the job, so we'll see if they end up regretting that. This ball is probably going straight to the end zone. It's put right where it needs to be, and it's caught, but what was Oregon State doing having one defender back here on three guys? With this extra point, Texas A&M's going to win, and the Beavers have been put out by the Aggies. That is why we always spectate until the final play, and North Carolina is trying to be the fourth ACC team to make the Elite Eight, which is exactly what they're going to do. They're up by 10 with about a minute left on the Buckeyes, and by the time Ohio State would get the ball back, it's pretty much all over unless they can pull off a comeback. Marvin Harrison Jr. just broke by the defense for a touchdown, but they missed the extra point because I simmed it, and North Carolina recovers the onside kick anyway, so it does not matter. The Tar Heels were able to get it done on the road, and Drake May is the reason for that. I cannot believe how much the ACC is dominating this playoff, but we have one more Sweet 16 matchup, and UTSA is the final underdog. All the other schools are a part of big conferences, so I'm hoping the Roadrunners are able to take down Shadur Sanders, but they're going to have to rely on their defense because they're only up by four with a minute remaining, and Colorado has the ball. With that jet sweep to Xavier Weaver, they were able to pick up the first down, and now Shadur's going to throw it for another 10. So it seems like the Buffaloes are about to go down the field and get the touchdown that they need as they're getting another first. But we have to remember that there's only 35 seconds remaining, so stuff like this hurts them a ton. By the time they're going to get the spike off, there's 20 seconds left, and they still have a long way to go to reach the end zone on this third and 16. Shadur's taking another sack, but instead of using their final timeout, they've simply hurried it up. They need a big gain here. This is not going to get close to reaching the marker. It is intercepted, and UTSA is going to win as a seven seed against Colorado. So we have an underdog story going into the Elite Eight, and if there's any college here that I want to see win it all, it has to be the Roadrunners. At this point, teams are playing for spots in the Final Four, and this is the final round not played on a neutral site, but it hasn't helped Louisville today. They have the home field advantage, but they're not even hiking the ball, so with two seconds left, this is going to be the final play of the game, and the Cardinals aren't going to get anywhere. They had a chance to potentially get into field goal range, but taking that sack threw them off, so Clemson advances instead, and as I'm feeling this, Washington's ranked fifth while Florida State's ranked fourth, so the Seminoles have the home field advantage, but right now they're trailing by four points, so they need to go down the field and score a touchdown to get the win, and we're about to see if they can do that or not. They still have 55 seconds left and two timeouts, so it's not going to be the hardest thing in the world, but Jordan Travis cannot afford to make any mistakes, and the Huskies are sending in blitzes. They're very fortunate that this wasn't ruled a catch, because honestly, it looked like he got a foot in, and that should have been intercepted, but because it was dropped, Florida State still has an opportunity to go deep, and they don't get it. It looks like Washington's defense is about to clutch up, unless they give up this fourth and ten to Keon Coleman, which is what they do, and I cannot believe they left him so wide open on that side of the field. They should have known better there. Now there's 25 seconds left. Florida State's going to get all the way to the five-yard line, and Jaheim Bell wants to get his team the win. Jordan Travis has taken a sack, though, so they are going to have to hurry it up and spike the ball. Washington has had their chances to get a stop on this third and goal. They are going to be able to make a tackle inbounds, but because Florida State had one timeout remaining, they're going to get one last shot at the end zone, and they are not going to pick it up. That one came right down to the wire, and Washington definitely deserved that win. They'll be playing against Clemson in the Final Four, and on the other side of the bracket, there are two more spots up for grabs. For as well as Texas A&M has played in the entire playoff, I thought they'd put up a better fight than this, but now they have to try and pull off a 24-point comeback, and it's just too much to ask out of this team, but they might recover the onside kick, and I think they did. However, there was a flag on the play for illegal touching, so Michigan is going to get the ball, and they can run out the rest of the clock. With the Wolverines going on to the Final Four, there's just one spot left, and I like Drake May and all, but I would love to see UTSA win. With a few minutes left, they're down by 14, but they're trying to come back, and the Tar Heels have gotten them to a fourth and goal where they're not going to pick it up. Unless they force 
force a safety. I don't think there's much hope for them. And North Carolina simply needs to get out of this position where if they get enough yardage, there's no chance they'll take a safety and they do just that. UTSA did their best, but nobody's been able to beat Drake May and he has pushed his team on to the final four where they'll be playing against Michigan. First, we have to see the other final four matchup though. And it all comes down to one final drive. Washington forced a stop on Clemson. So even though they're down by six, they have the ball back. But Michael Penix needs to get it out sooner and he should probably go for Roma Dunze who already has over 200 receiving yards, but it's intercepted by the Tigers instead. And I think they're gonna have a spot in the championship. I mean, if Washington plays their cards right, they could get the ball back with a few seconds left, but they're gonna push Will Shipley out of bounds. And I cannot believe he just ran towards the sidelines, but they could get the ball back if they were able to stop him, but they're not able to. I didn't expect Clemson to make the championship, but they've made a very good run for a five seed and they'll be facing either Michigan or North Carolina. I figured that Drake May could keep up with the Michigan offense, but that was not the case as they're losing by 17. So the Tar Heels didn't give us a good final four matchup and Drake May might've had his worst game yet while Blake Corm rushed for almost 200 yards. Even with the 126 team playoff, Michigan still finishes as one of the top teams. And it's time to see which of these colleges win the national championship. Approaching halftime, the Wolverines are gonna be down six to 10. And it's kind of weird that they are because they've played so much better. They have a lot more total yards, but a red zone turnover cost them a touchdown. And with a few minutes remaining, they're still down by four, but they have the ball and they're about to score. From here on out, we're obviously gonna need to watch every play and JJ McCarthy almost threw a pick, but instead he made this a third and manageable where they're gonna go for the end zone and they're gonna catch it. That puts the ball in the hands of Cade Klubnik and the Clemson offense, who's already getting about eight here. But to get into field goal range, they still have a lot more yardage that they need to gain and they keep picking it up. Michigan's gonna need to generate some pressure and Will Shipley takes this one for seven. So their defensive line is not able to get past this Clemson offensive line and that ball is somehow caught in bounds and they get the first. Cade Klubnik floated it so high in the air. I thought he sailed it, but now he's about to take a sack. And the fact that he made it back to the line of scrimmage is impressive. This one's gonna go for another eight, but there's just a minute left on the clock now. So they might not get a touchdown on this drive. I'd assume they're in field goal range, but if I were them, I would not wanna play for overtime and this is gonna be a tackle in bounds. So Clemson is down to one timeout remaining and I'm not sure why they've been burning through them so early, but they're going for the end zone and that's it. Tyler Brown puts the Tigers up by four, assuming that they make the extra point, which I watch, and Michigan's gonna need a touchdown to win. They have 48 seconds and three timeouts. JJ McCarthy's gonna try to go deep, but Clemson did not let him get that ball out. So we'll see what they draw up on second and 10 and that is not it. Blake Corm's a fantastic player, but you don't wanna put him in that position. Now they have to get this. And Roman Wilson really needed to hold on to this football because he dropped it though. It's fourth and 13 where they go with the halfback draw and Clemson is going to win it all. I was not expecting to see the Tigers as the national champion, but in the 126 team playoff, they've come out on top. And that concludes the biggest tournament that I've done in a long time. I have done some others in the past though. So if you haven't seen them yet, I'd recommend checking out these two videos.